Hello, and thank you so much for tuning in to the She Can Ball podcast. I'm your host, Mahi Jariwala. Today, we're joined by a sports psychologist, Rebecca Smith. Thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate your time. Of course, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into mindset and performance coaching? Yes. So I was a gymnast. Nobody would know that because I'm 5'10". So everyone's like, oh, you're a little tall for gymnastics, which was, you know, part of part of the issue, but I was, I love gymnastics. I did it since I was little and I was the kid who had, I had very, I had bad performance anxiety. I would get, I was either completely fearless or I would sort of freeze up and hesitate. And so I remember going to gymnastics camp one year and I saw a sports psychologist lead us through a visualization. So we all laid out across the blue floor and closed our eyes and had to imagine doing a skill in our minds. And that week I was able to do a skill that I had been trying and trying and trying, but I just couldn't get confident enough. And then I saw it in my mind and I went and I did it and was like, Mm -hmm. uh, that's like sold. I want to be a sports psychologist. Like, how did she do that? I thought that just like, just that one little taste of visualizing. And I was like, this stuff works. This is gold. So then long story short, um, I ended up going to school, getting my master's in sports psychology, and then specialize in, in working with athletes like me, basically the you know, 12, 13, 14 year old, like high, strong perfectionist who kind of is her own worst enemy and melts down under pressure. So that's, that is my passion is helping girls like me, you know, build confidence. Yeah. That's really awesome that you kind of took something you're passionate about and like created your own career path out of that. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And I know like right now, I mean, with the situation with COVID, I mean, like I was one of those people that was practicing and training for about a year. And now we're kind of going back into the, the scope of like playing games and being in those high pressure situations. So do you have any advice for just people that are returning to playing basketball or playing any sport after a whole year of basically not being able to do anything? Yeah. So I, I like to think of the mind Um, similar to a muscle in a lot of different ways. Like if you get injured, you ease back in, right? You, your expectations are low. You kind of, you tiptoe in, you follow the guidance. You, you know, if you, if you roll your ankle, you're not going to be like, I should be, well, many people actually would be like, I should be perfect. I really should be able to play hard, but that's not going to help you. If you go like, okay, I'm going to just see how I feel, I'm going to ease in. I'm going to keep my expectations low and I'm just going to be curious and try to be really mindful. I'm going to tune in. And if it's hurting, I'm going to back off. I'm going to communicate with my coach and my teammates. And I know this is temporary. That's the great thing about injury is that, you know, it's temporary, you know, it will eventually heal. So even though it's a bummer, you're like, it it will get better. So I can afford to be mellow for a little while as I ease back in. I think a lot of people post COVID, We're like, I should be perfect. I should be amazing. I should be confident. They don't factor in that like their muscles atrophy, like their mutt, like everything starts to kind of bleh. And we have so much anxiety on ourselves as a culture, as individuals in general, the, the level of anxiety this past year has skyrocketed, especially for, you know, young adults and adolescents and teenagers. It's like, everything is different and nothing is predictable. So we go in and we're like, I'm already nervous and I think I should be perfect. So if you can just start where you are, whatever that is, if you play your first game and you're like, wow, I'm terrible, then that's point A, you know, and then you go and you play your next game and you get a little better and you get a little more confident and you get a little more of like you're back in your body a little better. And if you can just know this is temporary and I'm going to get a little better every week, that's a much healthier way of looking at it. So then you can feel like you're actually making progress instead of always being like, but I used to be here. I should be here. Why is she there? And I'm like this, just cut all that out and be like, here's where I am. It's okay. Let's go get a little better. Yeah. I think a lot of times we just set like expectations for ourselves, even if they are attainable. I think that if you go in with those expectations and you're like, I need to do this, like you're never going to get there. Yeah. And it's, it's like, that will always keep moving out. Like the carrot, like the horse chasing the carrot. It's like, well, when I get here, I'll be better, but shoot, she's there now. Okay. Well, when yeah. I get here, I'll be good. Oh, well, cause there's always going to be somebody out in front of you. There's always going to be some reason why you're not good enough. If you're constantly comparing yourself outward, 
But if you can be like, okay, I was here, then I got injured or then COVID or then we had to quarantine or then I rolled my ankle or life, right? Yeah. And then you can't be like, well, it should be this way. Ah! And you can, but it's not useful. Instead, you, the best thing you can possibly do is every single day you walk into practice and you go, this is what is, now let's improve instead of like all the judgments and expectations. That's like, I talk a lot about you and I talked before about self-trust and being able to just trust your body to do what it knows how to do. If you if you have expectations or comparisons, or perfectionism or overthinking, all those things prevent your body from just executing. So if you can just be present and be like, okay, let's see what's in there and let's keep improving. Yeah. That's the best mindset. Exactly. Especially with basketball. And I think like I was someone who I used to go into games and this was really, really bad, but I think my eighth grade year, so like I'm in ninth grade. So like about a year ago, I would go into, like, I would have so much fun in practice because I wouldn't really be thinking. And I think I was still thinking a little bit, but I was more of just reacting and I got into games and I was like, all right, like this is a game and it has to be serious. and Everything has to be serious. So I'd be thinking about it in my head and I it's so bad now that I say it loud, but I'm like, all right, so here's the ball and I'm playing defense. All right, what are we doing? Oh, what she's doing? Okay, and we're gonna like do this. And I was like literally being a puppet in my own head and it was terrible. I didn't have fun in games and I wouldn't, I wasn't doing well either. And I think that like now it's kind of just a realization where it's like you've put in the work and you know what to do and you kind of just let your body do it. Yes. And, and so when you're trying to figure out the best way to approach a game, now everybody's going to have a different mental strategy. Like for me, visualization worked, but I bet a lot of girls on that floor who were visualizing, they were like, I can't really see the picture. I don't really know. So everybody has a different ideal mental strategy, but you know, you do well in practice, right? You're pretty solid in practice. So there's something you're doing in practice that works for you. And then we humans, we make the mistake of like, oh, now it's important. So now I have to yeah. do a bunch of stuff because <laughs> it's important. And then when you start doing the stuff, like if you don't visualize and you do great before practice, then you wouldn't need to like, okay, I got to put on my headphones and I got to visualize and I got to jump up and down three times. And then I got to really think and focus. <laughs> People are like, you have to focus. I'm like, what? You have to stress out on purpose. That's helpful. <laughs> yeah. So you, like you actually would be better off to go, well, what do I do before practice? Hmm. I listen to music in the car. I do my homework. Um, nothing, nothing really. Like what, what do you do? I'm curious, Mahi, what's your pre 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 pre-practice routine? Oh, that's so, you know, I've never actually thought about this. Yeah. I mean, doing homework and then I kind of just drive in the car and talk to my mom. I think like the biggest thing is like, before I get into practice, like I'm always super excited. Like, I know we're going to have fun. And like, I know I just, I like to have fun. And that's like my main goal going into practice. Cause I'm like, it's just practice, but like this, this game, like could literally end tomorrow. Like I could die tomorrow and I never get to play basketball again. So like, if I'm not having fun, like there's really no point in playing. And like, I know that when I'm having my fun, I'm doing the best I can. So. Yes. Yes. And that's a clue you can pull from practice because you have fun at practice. And if that works for you, if just being relaxed in the car, hanging with your mom, not doing anything in particular, going in, wanting to have a good time, not worrying about how you perform at all. If that makes you a great player in practice, then that's the exact routine you want to do before a game. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like anything fancy, right? But it works. You have proven, you've already done a million experiments on this works. (laughs) So then for your game, you're like, all right, mom, we're just going to hang out and talk about things other than basketball. And then I'm going to get there. I'm going to have a good time. I'm not really worried about how I do. It doesn't sound like like I, it's very important and I have to focus because it's, it's like, it, it's just what works. And then your brain's like, Oh, good. No weird threat. Cool. Let's play <laughs> basketball. <laughs> and then you don't get tense and you don't get like ping pongy in your mind. Yeah. But I think just like the whole situation and how everyone around you is just like super locked in on like a certain goal or like whatever it may be. And like just the pressure in the room, like how do you deal with the pressure? Like how can you like before the game, like really learn to manage your nerves? Yeah. So I have two like really quick little mind hacks that I love going into games is that first of all, the word pressure, when you think about pressure, it's like you get tense already. Just thinking about it. Like, Oh, I could fail. I could disappoint. What if I get pulled? What if I let my team down? It's like, you can immediately flash forward into the future of everything going wrong. The second you think about even the concept of pressure, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, I'm going to fail. I just know it. It's that's humans. We like to hedge our bets. We like to set ourselves up of like, I think the tiger's going to eat me. I'm out. 
like, I'm not messing with that tiger. You know, I think the, the other team is going to eat me. I'm just going to like curl up into a ball and try not to die. It's, <laughs> it's our biology. So we have to, we have to work against it and be like, okay, my brain is supposed to think everything's going to go horrible. It's okay. It's normal. So then instead of thinking of the pressure, I'm going to think, well, what if it was a challenge? Like my, do you like a challenge? Are you like a competitive person? Would you say? Yeah. And most athletes I talk to, they're the same. They're like, I'm going to win. Okay. Now, Mahi, I have another question for you. Would you rather get an A in an easy class or a hard class? Hard class. Okay. Would you rather win against an easy team or a hard team? Hard team. Okay. So is it fair to say you like a challenge? Yes. Okay. So take that, which is true. You can feel it in your bones. You're like, oh yeah, I like a challenge. I'm not, I'm no cupcake. (laughs) You go in and you're like, awesome. This is a challenge. This is a hard situation that I'm up against, which I thrive in because I like it. And winning is going to feel so good. Bring it on. It's a challenge that I want to rise to rather than thinking about the other side of the coin, which is there's pressure and I could fail. Mm -hmm. It's literally just like pointing your focus at a different part of the equation. Like the potential is like, I like a challenge. This is a challenge. Let's go handle it. True. So, that, so there's that. If you like, I would say remove the word pressure from your vocabulary and throw challenge in there. And that will do you tons of favors on, on big game days. You're like, let's go. It's a hard team. Okay. We got this. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And like a lot of people, I mean, most people that play basketball, like the challenge. I mean, I think the way I kind of think about it is like, I like going against people's best. Like, I don't like when people are just messing around because I want to know that I can actually get past you because you're playing your hardest, not just because like we're playing in a like random game, but like when you're in a game, everyone's on their best. Everyone's super serious. So you, if you beat them, you did beat their best. And that gives you some sort of satisfaction in a way. Absolutely. The game, I used to play soccer when I was younger, the game, I will never forget the one most memorable game. We were one of the worst teams in the, in the whole league. I don't know why. It was just like the grouping. We were just like, well, we're having a good time, but we were not the best team. And we beat the highest ranked team. I will never forget. Cause like there were no, nobody thought we were going to win, but we were like, you know what? We're going for it. Like, yeah, if, if we fail fine, nobody's going to be surprised, but and we like we took them down. It was like 13 to zero or something. Like we we demolished this team. And it's like it's like I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Cause it was like <laughs> nobody's expecting it, right? So that exactly. like I like a challenge. Be like, like, oh yes, let's make that happen. We were just like, we were focused. And that again, like coming back to that self-trust, we didn't have any expectations. All we had was heart. That's all we had. And like we were gonna be okay if we lost. And I think that's one of the things that it seems a little backwards, but if you go into a game and you're like, it's okay if we lose, but we're going to play our hearts out. We're going to do the best we can. We're going to be present. We're going to like really, really try moment by moment. And the outcome is out of my control. So we'll just see, like, let's get in and do this point. Let's get in and do this point. And like, it's, it just, it brings out the joy that you probably have in practice, right? Like, let's just like this one right here. Come on. Ooh. And then do the next one. But I feel like, how can you stay right there in that moment? Like, it's really hard to stay locked in, especially when there's a bunch of people, like, especially even like coaches, like yelling at you, people telling you what to do, fans, like, how do you stay right there in that moment and not think about everything else? Yes. So there's this, there's this concept um, called flow theory, and it's all about the different elements you have to have in place mentally to get yourself into the moment, totally focused and completely trusting. And then you get into this thing called flow, or some people call it the zone where you're just like on your best game. You're not thinking, you're not worrying. You're just like, boom, boom, can't miss. (laughs) It's almost like you're like in the matrix and you're slow motion and you're just like getting everything just right. The main ingredient of that is being present in the moment. It's like, you know, you you go to a raffle and they say you must be present to win. It's the same with sports. (laughs) You have to be in the moment in order to win. So I, I love Um, Okay. I'll preface this. I am not a fan of meditation. It is very hard for me personally. I am like, my mind is like, busy, busy. (laughs) so it's hard for me to just sit, close my eyes, breathe and try to get calm. But I can do things like um, walking the dog, 
and just be like feeling my feet on the ground and looking at the leaves on the trees as I walk. And anything you can do to practice being present, even for two minutes a day, like two minutes of breathing, two minutes of walking, or if you, um, you know, if you run laps and warm up, you run mindfully. So you're running and you're just feeling your feet on the floor or you're hearing the squeak or you're breathing mm-hmm. one, two, three, one, two, three. And then you're going to be like, do, do, do I have this thing do tomorrow? And you bring it back to one, two, three, one, two, three. And then you're going to be like, oh, wow, that girl's rude. And then you're going to bring it back <laughs> one, two, three, one, two. And if you do that a couple minutes a day, what you're doing is you're training your mind. Your mind is used to going like flash to the future. I'm going to fail. What if I miss? And then you're like, no, 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 come back, come back. One, two, three, one, two, three. And whatever that present moment focus is, the more that you practice it, the better you get at in those clutch moments being like, I'm here. I'm not out in the failure that's about to happen. If this goes wrong, that I'm afraid is going to happen. And last time it went wrong. And what if, and it's like, it's too late. You already made a mistake. So does that make sense? Like just those little practices of bringing your mind back to the moment Mm -hmm. over time, it becomes a skill and you get really good at it. It's like Mm -hmm. you hear about pro basketball teams doing yoga and, and meditation that's why it gives you it. It's basically like training the muscle of your mind to be present and wander and be present again and wander and be present again. It's all just a, it's like just an exercise of that over and over. Mm, like, let's say like, I just made a mistake. Like, how do I get back? How do I like not think about that and move on? Okay. So the, it depends on like the scenario. So if you, if you are on the bench you made a mistake. That's one thing versus like, I have one second and I'm back in. Um, so if you have an actual moment, like there's a timeout or there's, um, like you're out for a second, then I recommend having what I call a bounce back routine where you kind of feel your feelings and you're like, Oh, I'm so mad at myself. And I was, Oh, what is wrong with me? Like you give yourself 10 seconds or two breaths to just like clench up and be like, I'm so mad. And then when you unclench, you exhale, you let it go and you come back to the moment, you know, or something to that effect. You drink, you drink water and the water washes it down and you got a clean slate back to the moment. If you have only one second, you know, it could be a dribble. It's like reset button, boom, back. Or, you know, you can like smack your leg. You can snap your fingers. You can do something that allows you to be like, I'm mad, letting it go. I mean, you can really even do that, that clench and release while you're on the court. But I like something like that, where you are, the first element is you are acknowledging your feelings instead of pushing them down. You're like, Ooh, I'm frustrated. Dang. I feel bad about that. Oh, that was frustrating. And then you kind of feel it and then you let it go. And then the, the third piece is that refocus on what's right now. So again, it's a practice. If you practice bouncing back. So I would say when you go to practice next, see if you can kind of hope for a mistake so you can practice this and then, (laughs) and then be like, okay, I made a mistake. I'm frustrated and (sighs) clean slate. Next point, Mm -hmm. you know, just, but to have that little teeny bit of like that little moment of ceremony around actually letting it go can be very useful. So like baseball players will do it in the dugout. Um, like they're, it, it all golfers will, when they let go of their club, they'll let go of the hole, but it can be good to have something that you do. That's like, and reset. Mm-hmm. So, but it takes practice. You know? Yeah. I like like the acknowledge part of it. I think oftentimes we're like, all right, just like forget about it or like get rid of it. But I think like when you actually like say, okay, like that's valid, but like, we're going to still move forward. Yes, exactly. Because then you're not ignoring it. Cause whatever you ignore, you kind of pack down inside of you yeah. and then it comes out at an inconvenient moment, usually like at your mother, you know, <laughs> or like at your sibling or at like, ah! yeah. or you're crying on the court, which is never fun, you know, like, <laughs> like, Oh gosh, make it stop. You know, that it's good to give those. And you know, you get to the elite levels, right? You get to the high levels. There's no crying. There's no, there's no, none of that. And it might mean that you, you learn to cope through the game and you just compartmentalize and you're like, next point, next point, next point. And you go home and you cry your face off. You know, that's allowed too. It's totally healthy to be like, I'm so stressed. I'm so frustrated. I wish it didn't go this way. And you feel it, you journal it, you talk with somebody you trust 
and then you let it go and you reset ultimately. But I'm, I'm a big fan of feel those feelings so they don't come up when you least expect them because they didn't go away. You got to feel them to get through them. Yeah. Even like once you do make a mistake, usually someone's going to tell you something, whether that's your coach that yells at you or like a teammate, like how do you deal with that as well? So it depends on the delivery of the coach. Like if your coach is just a big jerk, which I'm sure your coach is lovely, you know? yeah. <laughs> coach, we love you. Um, <laughs> but if the coach says something in a way that you're like, wow, that was super rude. Like, thanks. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> I already felt bad enough. Now I feel yeah. really bad. I like to put up a filter. So the filter only lets in the constructive stuff. So if the coach is like, if, you know, like, how could you make this mistake? If you do this again, you will be, you will never make a college team, whatever, like horrible random thing that they might say in the heat of the moment. Then what you would let in is the, just the correction of like, this is what needs to get fixed. And everything bounces off the filter that leads to you feeling like it's impossible or I'm not good enough or any judgments or criticisms bounce those right out. And then all, the only thing that gets in is, okay, coach, I'm going to fix this. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, and just see if you can eliminate their criticism. Cause you, I mean, we humans, again, we are always judging ourselves. We're always criticizing ourselves. We're always picking apart our weaknesses. So if we can just not take that on from anybody else and only take the part that's going to make you better in it takes practice. Again, all of this stuff, like I said, the mind is a muscle. You got to train this stuff, but you get, when you get good at it and you're like, thanks coach, I'll make that adjustment. And you really mean it because that's all you let in. That can, that can be helpful for anyone who's a perfectionist and likes to be liked and likes to be, you know, I like a good compliment from a coach and you don't always get them. So then you're like, okay, I'll work on this. And then thanks coach. Got it. I'll take care of it. Yeah. I think like when it happens to us, like, I feel like I get really like, oh, like, why would you say that about me? But like, when you watch other people, like, I feel like in a way I understand that, like, I see someone doing something like, oh, that's wrong. And I don't say anything, obviously, but then the coach comes out and he's like, oh, you're doing it wrong. And I'm like, man, like, if that was me, like, I could have literally like, they could have scored the basket. And I'm like, if that's me, I want him to tell me that because then I can make the basket. Yes. And that's mental toughness being able to say like, I do want the criticism. I want, I want to get better. I want you to be constructive with me. Like, tell me what I, where I can improve, but it's when someone has fragile confidence that they're like, I need to feel like I'm okay. So you have to tell me I'm okay. Am I okay? Am I okay? You know, you got to like be grounded in the fact that you're good enough. Even if you're the worst one on your team, you're just right. That's point a, you're going to get better. You're going to keep getting better. And the way to get better is to listen to what they're saying, filter out any negativity or judgment or criticism and put it to work, you know, and and you, even though you're like, you know, a little scrawny, scrappy one who's the worst one on the team can then just get used to like, okay, tell me what I can do. Tell me, okay, I'll get better at that. I'll try harder. And then eventually that's the person who's going to like, who's going to end up going the farthest in the sport because they're like, I don't need someone to compliment me all the time. I just need to know what to do. And then I'm going to go do it. And I'm going to know that I'm okay, even if I'm not the shining star right now, because I'm going to keep getting better. And that's like, end of story. That's grit. It's like, I will keep getting better coach. I will keep getting up. I will keep getting up. I think what's hard is like realizing that like you might not like improve every single time. Cause I'm always like, yeah, I want to get better, but then like you do really well and then you do bad again. So I'm like, all right, so my bad again, like what just happened? Yes. So I, I, this is going to sound horrible and you'll probably hate that. I, I, t- I tell athletes that I coach, I'm like, oh, you know what you learned that, you know, what got better? Your character. Wah, wah. <laughs> you know, like there are, <laughs> there are days where you get better physically and there are days where you build character and there are days when you build grit and there are days when you build determination and there, and all of those things are part of like, if you're baking a cake that was like your college scholarship or whatever your, you know, your big goal is you got to put all those ingredients in. You got to fall on your face and get back up. You got to get yelled at and not cry. You got it. Like all of those things are in that cake that make it the beautiful cake that you, that you baked over those 10 years. And you're always getting better. Always. It just doesn't always look like a physical improvement. It Mm -hmm. looks like, like your skin got a little thicker, you know, and your heart got a little bigger and you, you got a little grittier. And you just kept at it. And like that, I know a girl just got a scholarship to UCLA and it's like, that kid was the grittiest kid I'd ever met. 
Like she wasn't the most talented, but she worked hard. She had heart. She was positive and she kept getting back up and kept getting back up. You know, and it's like, that's, that's what you're building on those bad days. And sometimes you just got to like, be like, all right, today was a character day. Bummer. <laughs> I don't like the character days, <laughs> but yeah. you know, like they're part of the, they're part of the cake, they're part of the recipe. Yeah. I think even like going through those tough moments, whether that is something like that, or like, even when you're part of a workout and like, you're going through like a really hard, like you're holding a plank and you're like at the very end of like what you usually do, like how can, like, what do you, what do you, you suggest that people tell themselves? Like, how do you keep going? Yeah. So, okay. So I do Pilates and like, I know that moment where it's like, I want to quit so badly right now. And it's well, so easy. What, you just put your feet down and you're done. You're done. Put your knees down. You're like, oops. Yeah. And so it really depends. Like those are the moments where you got to have a strong why. Like, why are you doing it? Why am I doing Pilates? Because it feels good to get out of the house and I want to be strong. And like, I always feel good after. I'm not going to win the Pilates championship of the world. It's not happening. <laughs> you know, but if I was like, I'm going to get a Pilates scholarship. I'm going to get it in three years. And this is the school I'm going to go to. And this is why I would hold the dang plank. You know, I'd hold that plank. <laughs> I would be like, Okay. She wants the scholarship too. So does she, I'm going to outplank them. I don't care if I'm shaking. I don't care if I'm going to be in pain tomorrow. Like I want this. And that's the difference in those moments that you can be a hundred percent satisfied with your performance and give it 90% effort or 80% effort or 70% effort. You get to choose. And, but the difference is like, I'm very happy with how I execute my Pilates and I am not the best one in the class and I don't need to be old me would have needed to be current me. I'm like, I showed up. I'm proud of myself. Good job. Like I got a little stronger today, but if you like, if there's something you're gunning for and you're like, I want to be a starter and I want to go to this school and I want to be on this team. That's, that's where you have that in you during that plank. And you're like, don't give up. Yeah. But then when you're playing your game, that's when you forget all about those goals and things and you just get in the moment. So you, goals are great for moments like that in training, but then when you're, when you're actually executing, that's when it's time to just be totally present. Yeah. Like, where do you think you draw the line between like competitiveness where you're like, Oh, I want to be here to the point where you're not comparing yourself. Yes. So there are six things that build confidence based on this study by Bandura. There's six things that make you feel like I can do it. One of them is seeing your peers succeeding. Now, each of the things that builds confidence actually also can like take away from confidence if used improperly. So for example, the first person to ever break a four minute mile, it was in the fifties and everybody was like, it's not possible, not physically possible. You cannot run a mile in four minutes. Your legs will fall off. Like they, no one had ever done it. So people were like, oh, you can only get to like 401 or like whatever, 501, like whatever. Anyway, math is not my thing, but you get, the, you get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then somebody breaks it and guess what? 12 people immediately mm. break the record because they're like, holy cow, it is possible okay, I'm doing it. So you can, you can look at what someone else is doing and be like, whoa, look what she pulled off. Okay. It's possible. I'm going to do what she's doing. What's she doing? What's she up to? How'd she get so good? And like, that's what I do in my business. I'm like, I want to hang out with people who have successful businesses because I want to do what they're doing. Like, what are yeah. you doing? Like, <laughs> tell teach me your ways. Let me hang out with you. And the same with athletes hang out with the girl who's better than you and be like, what is she doing? Oh, she does not cheat on conditioning. She holds her plank. She's focused. Okay. On the weekends, she's getting enough sleep. Like there's certain things that you can, you can learn from those people and be like, I want to be around you because I want to be like you instead of that. Again, that fragile confidence person will be like, she's better than me. And it makes me feel bad. So therefore what's the point you get all Eeyore about it. And you're like, oh, I'm not as good. <laughs> but it's your choice. You know, just like we can choose pressure or challenge, you can choose jealous or inspired. And so if you, you know, if there's a person who particularly like bugs you and you're like, Oh, why is she so perfect? I hate her. <laughs> That's the girl you want to be like, I'm going to become best friends with her. Like, I want to hang out with her. I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this work because if she can do it, so can I. Mm -hmm. And you know, ultimately 
anything that you're thinking about outside of you in the moment is a distraction. So you can play that same game about like, I'm going to just do my mindful jogging at the beginning of practice. And if I think about her, I'm going to bring it back to my breath. Think about her, back to my breath. Think about winning or losing, back to my breath. And just like keep bringing it back and notice like, oh, that person's a distraction. So every time I see her, it's going to be a reminder to come back to my breathing and come right back to the moment. So you can actually use them to help you in that way too, as a reminder to practice getting present instead of thinking outside of yourself. Yeah. Cause I, so visualization, like, I don't know, it didn't really work for me. So one thing I tried was like finding other people that have like similar, just like similar game like me. So I like to shoot a little bit more and I'm on the skinnier side. So I don't always like to drive. I'm always afraid of contact. So I like to like, look at other like high school, some around my age players that are a little bit skinnier that are doing the things that I want to do. And I watch them do it. And I'm like, and that gives me so much confidence in itself. Like I literally watched those videos and be like, okay, I can totally do that. And I didn't understand if that was like a visualization thing or like what was happening, but yeah. Yeah. And some people are more visual and actually need to see a video of people doing well. Like your version of visualization is watching girls who look like you do what you want to be able to do. That's, that is a spot on strategy. Some people have a really hard time actually making images appear in their mind and need to have their eyes open and need to like, I know gymnasts who need to have a pen and like flip it around in their hands because they're really like tactile. So they need to pretend like that's me flipping through the air or like, oh. here's me on my little like drawing of a basketball court. And like, this is what I do in this play. Like it, it, you can get creative because it's ultimately you want all your senses involved. You want to be able to feel it, smell it, taste it, touch it. Like once you can create an image in your mind, that's really multi-sensory so that it feels like virtual reality. That's when your brain is going to start lighting up your muscles. And it's, it's, almost equivalent to physical practice in what's happening electrically in your body. It's so cool. So if you can watch videos, that's going to be happening to some extent inside of you that your brain's like, Ooh, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do this. Okay. Well, it's filing away that information so that you can duplicate it next time. Yeah. It's so crazy. Like the amount of like your mindset and like the mental like situation you're in has an impact on your game. Yeah. Especially when it's like pressure time, right? Oh yeah. I've heard so many Olympians who say that practice is 90% physical, 10% mental and games are 10% physical, 90% mental that you, it's like, if you're in the zone, you do great, but there's a lot of things you can do to, to make it great. You know, it's like all these little, these little things that you can train into your mind that are just like your muscle memory that eventually you get to the point where you're like, yeah, of course I'm good under pressure. Let's do it. Yeah. You trust it. Exactly. And I have one more question. So, you know, after like a bad game, like what should you take? Like what steps do you think one should take? Is it similar to like the mistake to like make sure that like you acknowledge it and then you kind of like move forward? Cause I think it's easy to kind of like fall into like almost like a slump and then mm-hmm. rather than just like bouncing back. So when you look at some of the yes. best players and like they know how to bounce back, like they have a bad game. You watch them score 40 points the other day and like mm-hmm. they're doing exactly. the thing. <laughs> Yeah. So I like to journal. I like, a, and I, I would recommend journaling, not just on the bad days, but the good days too. So that, and you ask yourself three questions. The first one, what went well? So even if it was the worst game of your life and you're like, nothing went well, it was the worst, not a single thing. I'm like, where's your hair cute? Like something, something <laughs> was good. Okay. Like you were really positive when you were on the bench. You were like cheering your team on great, whatever went, there's always, you can always find three good things from the worst game ever. Then you ask yourself what, where's the room for improvement? Okay. So this is not like, where, why am I horrible <laughs> myself up on paper? It's where's there room for improvement. So even in your best day, you can go, well, this can still get better. And you come up with something concrete, like, well, I can, I can adjust this with my technique. I can adjust this in the way that I approach this. And you, you write down three things where there's still room for improvement. And then the third is what did I learn? Okay. And the lesson is not that I'm horrible and I have no talent and I'm the worst. My coach hates me. It's like, when this happens, I get anxious and I need to have something in place. Or I got in my head when this happened, you know, those lessons are so valuable because then you start to notice after the good games, you got lessons after the bad games, you got lessons after both of them. So it sort of dissolves the pressure and you're like, 
no matter how I play, I will come away with this with, with new wisdom that's going to improve my future games, my future self. So all of that is good. The bad games are the most valuable for figuring out what works and what doesn't mentally. So if you're trying to get mentally tougher, start a journal, especially right down on those bad days and start to see, you're going to see some patterns and you're going to start to realize, oh, that one chick like gets under my skin and I just can't play well. What's that about? Okay. Here's the lesson. Here's what I think I can learn from this. And then you, it gets you in this like constructive way of like, Hey coach, can you help me with this thing that I keep kind of blowing? I know I can improve here. What can I do? So that period of reflection where, and then you close it and you put it away <laughs> and you let it go and, and you allow yourself the permission to fail, but under one condition, you are required to learn something from it. So there's no, no wasted failures. Every failure is valuable. And if you can be like, if I fail, I'm going to learn something really important. So <laughs> here we go. And then that allows you to relax. Cause you're like, I'm not so afraid of failure. Cause I know it's valuable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know easier said than done, but all of this, like you start where you are and then you just start kind of putting it into place and you get to the point where you're like, yeah, failure is a part of the deal. So let's just get after it and see what happens. Yeah. You know, one thing I like about this conversation, I think, and I think people listening are going to realize this too. Some of these things like they've done just like unconsciously and it's worked for them. And like, now they're kind of realizing, okay, that's why it worked. But like, if you actually know, and you actually do it, like imagine all the stuff that could go much better. Yes. Just like a little bit of extra effort into training your mind along with all the effort that goes into training your body. It makes the whole, whole thing more enjoyable. Then you have this more like this less fragile confidence and more grit. I mean, it, it pays dividends, especially, and that's why I love working with athletes who are, you know, 12, 13, 14, cause I'm like, install this stuff now. It's like, Oh, it gives me goosebumps again. Like, I'm like, Oh, get this in there now. And just imagine, imagine how great you can be. If you're already physically talented and like, you got your mind, you know, like prepared for battle. Ooh, it'd be so unstoppable. It's so exciting. Yeah. So Thank you so much. I had a really good time talking to you today. Yes, me too.